I'm Alex Rampel. I'm a general partner here at Andreessen Horowitz, where I mainly cover things fintech or financial technology. And I'm here with Terry Angelos, who is the SVP of Commerce Solutions at Visa. But I know him better as my co-founder at TrialPay, which we started. So if today is April 24th, 2018, I believe we incorporated TrialPay in April of 2006. So I've known you for 12 years. That's right. Nice to be here. Great. Um, so, given that uh, that intro, uh, can you think back? Does your memory go far <laughs> enough? Can, you, can your random access memory go back to um, 2006 and maybe say how we met? Yeah, it was kind of a, a strange trip for me. I had um, I was I just finished up at business school and um, had gone back to South Africa. I was working on some projects there, and had flown back to Boston. Um, actually having some discussions with Hey Montanasia and General Catalyst and uh, happened to connect with Chris Dixon. Um, Chris uh, at the time was working on an interesting company, uh, was recruiting folks and, um, uh, and was sort of chatting with me about whether that might be a possibility. And at the time I said, you know, I really want to start something. And he said, well, you know, you're kind of, he didn't quite use the word idiot, but you're, you really should be saying, you shouldn't be saying no to me. But there's this other not quite idiot who also uh, I've been trying to recruit and uh, has said no, this guy Alex Rampel, and you guys should, should talk. And I think we chatted uh, on a Friday night, um, and, uh, and, and, and I was in New York at the time flying back to Johannesburg on Sunday. And after our conversation, I'm not quite sure what we talked about. But I got on a plane, flew to California the next day, canceled my international flight, um, and somehow met you in the office uh, right by the San Jose airport. Yeah, that, that my, my recollection from my perspective is who would be crazy enough? So I, I told you what I was doing, which was this idea of uh, offer-based payments um, called trial pay, or tentatively called trial pay. I think you didn't like the name. And uh, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going back to Johannesburg on Sunday, interesting idea. And then you're like, no, no, actually, I'm going to cancel that flight and come to California because I like this so much, I have to meet you. And then I think we, we met at that, that terrible bagel restaurant <laughs> That's right. right near the San Jose airport. I think it was called like bagel or or bagel, bagel House. Um, and that's, uh, that's how things started. And then it was a shotgun wedding thereafter. Because the other thing is you being a foreign national, you're like, OK, this is very interesting. And like we kind of talked about how we might work together. But the green card, not the green card, the um, H-1B visa application deadline is in like 10 days. So if we're going to do this, we basically have to do this. And then um, applied for your visa with my then little shareware company, Rampel Software. Rampel Software. And uh, you got your visa approved. You were one of the, because you had a master's degree. So it was a little bit easier to get your H-1B under that. And then you moved out here uh, with your then girlfriend, now wife. And then uh, I remember we, we, we met for dinner at uh, some Vietnamese restaurant in, in Mountain View. Actually, I think the first time we met was at the Shareway Conference in Orlando. Oh, that's the second true. time. That yeah. was the second time, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I do think, I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure as a general partner here, you don't have the luxury of, of uh, procrastinating. But in those days, I think the Alex I knew would have procrastinated a lot more on starting the company. So I guess we have the H1B deadline to thank for you know deciding whether or not to move forward with a with a co-founder. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, maybe maybe we should talk a little bit about the evolution of trial pay because if you think about where it is today, I mean now you run a, a big chunk at, of uh, commerce type stuff at, at Visa. This all started from like the Shareware conference in two thousand six. So. The first iteration of trial pay was this idea of, particularly for downloadable software applications, you don't want to pay for X, but you will pay for Y. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think what's the best way to explain to our audience here, like all the different trials and tribulations that we went through. But you know, maybe how that was the first model of trial pay. I mean, we never really changed what we did, but we had to evolve with the times. So any any interesting stories that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I think what. What was appealing about trial pay and was the thread that continued through trial pay and Yub and a few of the other iterations of the company was this really big idea that you had payments is usually a two-party transaction. 
and we were adding a third party into that transaction in a way that was beneficial for all three parties. Um, I think the, the challenge was to find an ecosystem where a three or multi-party transaction could occur. And so downloadable shareware software was a really good use case. And I think we um, were, um, you know, sort of fortunate that we, that sort of, you know, you knew that market and we were able to establish a beachhead. I think our challenge was finding similar markets. And so gaming was one that emerged um, where I think we established ourselves in that market. The challenges with these markets is that they develop very, very quickly. And so, um, you know, I think back on some of our, you know, to the tougher times of trial pay was where we had a very good solution for an ecosystem and then that ecosystem suddenly changed. And for us, there were a couple of step functions. One was uh, Facebook and Facebook applications, um, you know, completely changed gaming and sort of social gaming became a much bigger part of uh, the, the gaming ecosystem. Uh, and then mobile. Right. Um, and both of those step functions had impacts on our, you know, yeah, I remember it as, you know, so we had downloadable Windows and Mac software, primarily Windows, and that was kind of going like this, and then it fell off a cliff. And then as we were falling down that cliff, then social gaming was taking off, uh, the Zingas of the world on Facebook, and then that fell down the cliff, and then we had mobile, and then uh, we, well, we actually did a couple things. We, we kind of sold the company a couple times, I guess you could think of it, but um, we spun off Yub, um, so maybe it would be interesting to tell that story. And then um, we eventually sold the company to Visa, but the way that that happened was a little bit more of you know, thinking about this as not so much an offer wall, which was kind of the, the concept that was popularized for social gaming, but really transactional advertising. So I, I don't know if it would be, um, I just thought it was, I have a lot of respect for founders, um, mainly because that's kind of what we had to do a little bit, which is, all right, you have to keep applying, like you don't really change, what, you're not pivoting the company, you're kind of pivoting into a different market where the durability of the company is higher. Um, and I kind of think about that as, uh, that, that was what we had to do a couple times, shifting from this downloadable software to social gaming to mobile, um, but also recognizing some of the inherent weaknesses, like you know, we were a payments company, but we were also an ad tech company. Right. Um, so I don't know if, uh, recount some war stories for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think probably one of the hardest things that we had to do um, was navigate th those two S curves, right? So, um, you know, startups are difficult. I mean, finding product market fit is a really challenging thing to do. When you find it and you're successful and you build a business and a product around uh, a market that's growing, that's an incredible feeling. Um, but when that um, S-curve starts to flatten out, you know, this is the hard part, you now have to find a new innovation engine. And that was very difficult to do. You almost have to run at kind of two clock speeds. And so the hardest thing I think we did was uh, make the decision eventually to uh, really create a startup inside of trial pay. Um, and, um, and, and that was a way of, of us maximizing what we were doing on our, our, on our existing business, navigating that S-curve while creating something completely new. And that was difficult. And we had, to have, you know, we had to have separate teams. We had to motivate people separately. Startups are difficult. Creating a startup inside of a you know, eight-year-old company, six-year-old company is really difficult. And, and I think that created a lot of um, you know, sort of angst and pressure around how we would um, create two separate teams, structure that separately. You know, Clint Smith, our, our general counsel and, and uh, you know, um, all-around all uh, advisor on all things uh, difficult and strategy, I think pushed us in that direction. Yep. Um, and that was a hard decision to actually split the company. In the end, we did something kind of crazy. We, we you know, took two separate teams, separated them, had different identities, split the company, uh, and then actually found separate offices about a, a block from each other. And the thinking there was, the only way to really get a startup working is to have two separate environments. Right. Um, and I think that was the right decision. 
uh, and a very hard one. Of course, our responsibilities changed, um, and, and we had to fi figure that out. So th those were all hard things um, that I think we had to navigate. And, and in the end, a, you're saying it was a hard thing about a hard thing. <laughs> it was definitely hard. <laughs> Well, so yeah, my, my recollection on this, because now you know, I, I see startups all the time that are going through hard times. And you know, one of the things that we, I mean, just to, to explain to people what we ended up doing, you know, TrialPay was an offer-based payments platform. So we said, you, know, you get your Zynga game for free when we were doing Facebook game monetization if you go sign up for Netflix. And we had this nice idea that most of commerce happens offline. And people sign up for Netflix once every while. They shop at Gap.com every once in a while, but they spend most of their disposable income offline. Wouldn't it be great if we could have offline offers and say, you get your Zynga game or you get your Angry Bird Mighty Eagle for free if you do some offline element of shopping, but how do we know if that offline element of shopping actually happened? Well, wouldn't it be great if we could use credit card data to close the loop on that? And then how do we do that? It didn't exist, so we built that within trial pay. Um, but then it wouldn't have been successful just purely within trial pay, because in order for this concept to really reach critical scale, it had to be independent. Um, and then it also had this nice benefit, this was my recollection of it, which was as an eight-year-old company that uh, was no longer going up into the right, um, it's not like we were going down into the right, but uh, we weren't growing as quickly as we were, you know, the hard thing was in, in, in Silicon Valley, which is uber competitive, how do you keep and retain and attract the best talent um, when you're no longer growing 400% year over year? So you know, one of the nice things about splitting Yub, which I have my t-shirt from, Yub was really a t-shirt production company. <laughs> I think I have 20 of these. Um, but one of the nice things about splitting Yub from Trial Pay is that we were able to take people, like the, the, some of the people that stayed at Trial Pay Inc., were the people that wanted more management responsibility and wanted to work in a, in a different kind of company than people that said, oh, here's something that doesn't have product market fit, it's a series A startup. Because we basically birthed a series A startup from series D trial pay. So series A startup was Yub, it was an interesting idea, it didn't have product market fit, it could be big, but it didn't really belong in kind of steady as she goes trial pay. And I think that actually, that worked to the benefit of both. Because otherwise we would have had yeah. this great idea of Yub locked within trial pay. Um, and the other nice thing was that from a, from a cash perspective, because you know, startups are consuming cash just like you know, human beings consume oxygen, um, we were able to really lower the costs of trial pay significantly because we put 25 people into Yub, or the, the Yub Marine. Uh, we put 25 people into Yub, we had the rest of people at trial pay, and that was kind of a nice way of dealing with a, um, uh, a seismic shift to our business because we lowered our cost structure at trial pay. We allowed trial pay to focus more. We weren't doing 10 things. We were doing one thing. And then a lot of the new stuff, we kind of moved over to Yub. And this was this online to offline uh, network. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think as hard as it was, I think some, some of the things that worked surprisingly well was, um, you know, the benefits of focus were just tremendous. It's, it's you know, you think you can manage two different speeds and, and you're aware of them, but when you actually focus, it's amazing how much better you are at, at each of those individual items. Um, that was a big, I think that was a, um, that worked out better than expected. And I think people self-selected better. Yeah. So, um, you know, we had a set of folks who just uh, were very excited to grow the trial pay business and were, you know, um, I think, you know, felt that we were invest over investing in this new thing that was highly risky. And so once, you know, those folks could then focus on building something much bigger, and other folks who really just wanted to have another swing um, at something, you know, that had a, a much higher beta. So those two things I think worked much better than expected. Um, you know, I think there was. Um, a, uh, I, our founding team had a good relationship. Uh, yourself, Eddie, myself, were able to shift responsibilities in a way that I think was, in hindsight, you know, quite risky. Um, but that worked out. So, um, you know, overall, it probably worked out better than we had expected at the time, uh, given how much we were sort of concerned about it. Well, I, I kind of think there are, there are three ways of uh, compensating people. There's, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, 
There is cash, which is well known. That's kind of what drives most labor markets. There's equity, and then there's responsibility. And then there's t-shirts. And then there's t-shirts, which is kind of a form. It's, all, it's a combination of all three. Um, but the nice thing about what we did with TrialPay and Yub, it's kind of funny, like after we did this and then we saw, oh, eBay spun out PayPal, and then HP and HPE separated. So I, I like to think we began this trend. That's right. But I think one of the things that was very, very interesting is that it, it is that self-selection on responsibility. Um, because in some cases, like, it's a, it's a trade-off. Because if you want more responsibility, maybe it, you do join a startup, like a very, very early stage startup. And what does that mean that normally entails less cash, more equity, more responsibility? And those, those three bar charts, if you will, uh, they, they do self-adjust based on the stage of company that you go to. And at trial pay, we got people, the, the people that stayed, because this was a big concern that we had when we did split the company, is that would people say that those that were going, like was Yub the good company and TrialPay the bad company or vice versa? And we try to do it in a way where people self-selected and people that were excited about the new thing um, actually taking less compensation, more equity, uh, different types of responsibility, not management responsibility because you don't need managers at a very, very small company. Um, but you need a lot more management at a larger company. And that, I think that was one of the things that really helped us get through a, a challenging time on that. It wasn't quite an S-curve because normally the S-curve goes like this. We, we started going like, <laughs> our S-curve, well, I'm trying to think of the, the shape of that letter. It's probably not in, uh, in the Latin <laughs> alphabet, but it, it started going like this for each one of those. So I have my own set of answers on this one, but were there any times that you were absolutely paralyzed with fear that, that we were about to fail? I mean, I think failure for us, um, you know, we were fortunate that we had, uh, we had a business that produced revenue and cash, and we had cash in the bank. Um, um, there were some times when I think we um, sort of came close to, uh, you know, came close to, um, you know, pushing the limits on that. Um, but I, I think failure for, uh, for, for me personally was more, were we going to be able to become the kind of company that we had set out to become? Um, and I think that's maybe less of an urgent, you know, pay the bills type failure and much more, how are we going to realize a vision that we've had for a long, long time? And, and that, that was part of, I think, our, our story was um, we we're always very innovative and, and, and had built an incredible product. Um, and the question was, how did we, you know, how, how do we, Get that into the hands of you know millions and millions of, of uh, you know of, of uh, consumers. I don't know what's what's your uh, about to fail. I seem to recall about fifty. <laughs> I mean, I think my my biggest concern. I mean, if you remember this, when we were going into social gaming, um, at least I remember it this way. I was opposed to it, and I wasn't opposed to it, but. I thought that the quality, so like the key thing behind our business model actually working <laughs> is that if we, we were doing something called incentive marketing. Um, so as opposed to like you drive down 101, you see, a you see a big billboard and it says Netflix is great and then you're like, okay, I remember that, maybe next week I'll go sign up for Netflix. We said you're on Fandango.com, you want a movie ticket, click here to get the movie ticket for free if you sign up for Netflix right now and we track that whole transaction end to end. And that worked okay, because if you take the Fandango case, like you're in the market for a movie ticket, that means you probably might like Netflix, you would think, um, especially in 2006 when Netflix didn't have 100 million plus paying customers. We were a big chunk of that, but um, we helped them get there, I would say. I think we're almost 10% uh, of their signups at one point. Yeah, yeah, we, we were their biggest channel by far. Um, so this worked really well because this was incentive marketing. We're saying, we're going to give you something if you go engage with an advertiser. And that worked well from a one-to-one -one perspective. It didn't work well, or it had downsides if we said, okay, every time you go engage with an advertiser, you get 10 coins and you're addicted to coins. So you would get people you'd have a wall of all these offers, not one-to-one. -one. And I just, I had grave doubts around like, okay, we can do this and we kind of need to do it because the shareware business is, is falling apart. I'm not falling apart, it's just like, people used to download software from things like download.com in 2006. And then there was this seismic shift where like everything kind of went to cloud and web. And then there was another seismic shift where things went to mobile, but like neither of those really existed when we started the company in 2006. So, Social gaming was kind of this next wave. 
And it was kind of, I, I looked at it as a damned if we do, damned if we don't. Because if we don't do it, then our shareware business is going to go just teeter down into irrelevancy, so we can't do that. If we do do it, then the quality of customers that we're sending to advertisers like Netflix, and just to put it in context, like if we send somebody to Netflix, they, they sign up, they get their 5,000 coins in Farmville, and then they cancel Netflix like five seconds later, like why would Netflix pay us for that? Yeah. And the chance of that for business model 1.0 or like kind of market 1.0 was very, very small. The chance of that for model 2.0 or market 2.0, which was social gaming, was astronomical. And we had this problem, um, but all of our competitors had it, and it was this. It, it eventually became this uh, tragedy of the commons issue, where some of our competitors, they didn't care about this at all. I cared about this a lot because I just thought it went to the sustainability of the model. So we would have the the revenue equivalent of fool's gold, where we would grow tremendously, um, but a like would social gaming last, and then b even if it did, if we're sending very very bad quality customers to advertisers like. Is there going to be anything in it for us? And then C, which was almost more disconcerting, is was there any uh, was there any defensibility to the business? Because if we were sending people to Netflix and Gap and a hundred other advertisers, and so did other competitors, like how many of them do we have for? The, we I had like a hundred. I, I think the analogy that we talked about a lot was the notion of brown water, right? So we had this we had this sort of you know high quality, and this is one of our probably most discussed principles, which was, you know, how much do we focus on the quality of the customers that we're sending? And this is an area, I think, where we probably disagreed a little bit. Um, uh, and I think overall, your perspective um, was probably more durable, but created a few problems, which was we have to have super <coughs> high quality leads. Right. So of course, if we're this sort of channel of water with this super clean water, and competitors don't have the same, you know, sort of, um, you know, they have, the, the, their water isn't as clean. Ultimately, it often gets combined, and so it just becomes this brown water. And that was our debate was, you know, does, are, are we getting appropriately compensated for the care that we're putting in right. to, to, to make sure that our leads were particularly high, you know, particularly you know, good, good quality leads? And I think in times we probably, should have cared less about that, right? And there are other times where I think uh, it, it saved us. Um, and I think, you know, certainly, social gaming was one. We had huge debates over this, and and I, I remember uh, it, my sort of perspective was: we'll figure out. We have to go where the business is going. We'll figure out the advertising model. It turned out to be less commerce and more brand advertising and right. video advertising, which I think in the end was. Uh, an area that you know wasn't a, a sort of core strength for, for, for us, um, but we had to be in that market, and I think uh, well, in the end we. My concern was always even if we won, we would lose, um, because for, I think Furic victory came up a few times. Yes, uh, and that so that you know that wasn't we're about to fail. We only we never got to the point where we had like two weeks of cash left. We got to the point many many times where it's like the current trajectory would get us to two weeks of cash left at some point in time. Like there was no, it just seemed like there was no way off of the the downward slope, um, except if we did something new. But the challenge is that if we have an existing business that has tens of millions of revenue, which we did, and then we had all these new things that would produce nothing. But were interesting ideas like that was the again, kind of b both of those options were bad. The the other set of um, you didn't have to deal with this as often as I did, where we would get into an acquisition discussion, uh, which I believe happened like ten times before the ultimate one that worked, and uh, we'd get to the end and it's like yeah it's going to happen and I, I'd be talking to the corp dev people and it's like we're going to buy your company for hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and then uh, it just has to go through this final thing from the CEO of this big giant company, and then the CEO of the big giant company, I, I used to joke, had a bad tuna sandwich or something that morning, and then decided not to do it after, uh, after it seemed like a done deal. And that was, that was probably the toughest period, because it wasn't we're about to fail, but you know, one of the things with M&A in general is that um, I've now, th this has kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things, which is you cannot change people's minds with data. It just doesn't work. You can change people's minds with data and time. Um, and I now think about, I actually give this advice to people all the time in my current job, which is, you know, if somebody pitches me on Monday and I have a bad tuna sandwich and I say, no, I'm not interested in investing in your company, 
Um, I might be completely wrong, they might be completely right, but you can't change, like feelings are what they are. You can't, you can't change that. So if the person that pitched me on the company came back Monday night and said, hey, I think you were wrong, how about now? It's like, no. Well, here's new data, no. Like it's just, it's very hard to change perspective, perspectives with data. You need enough time along with data um, in order to reset belief systems. And sometimes you just need people, sometimes the, the data that needs to change are people that are working at a company. Like that does change out. So, you know, one of the challenges of if you get rejected by, especially in, in an M&A process, like a company doesn't go and say, hey, we want to buy your company. Uh, they do all this diligence. They're ready to go, and then the CEO says no on a Monday, and then on Tuesday they're ready to roll again. Like that institutional memory lasts for a long time. So, one of the every time we went through one of those processes, which, as you recall, there there were a handful of them. They were numerous. Uh, it fits on more than one hand, I believe. So several handfuls of them. Like that, that was very demoralizing because you know if you raise venture capital, you often, I mean, you're doing it not to run a quote unquote lifestyle business. You're doing it to eventually bring liquidity to the shareholders, and that's ideally, you know, it's an IPO, it's you get acquired. Um, and actually, may maybe this is kind of a good segue to something which was, you know, my, my key learning from trial pay, I and mean, there, there are thousands, and I'm sure you have thousands as well, but my key one, and actually th this became a, my first blog post here, because I called it innovation versus distribution. Um, and I, I kind of have this little pithy saying now, which is the battle between every startup and incumbent comes down to whether the startup gets the distribution before the incumbent gets the innovation. And this was my key thing. If you remember, I called it the TiVo problem at trial pay because we built this great appendage on top of payments. We made payments more lucrative. We made payments more profitable. Like everybody benefited, as you said, normally a payment transaction is two parties. We introduced a third to the benefit of all three. Um, and I think we did a very, very good job of that. The challenge was that we didn't control the payment infrastructure. So it was hard. I also called it the janitorial services problem, right. if you remember. It was very, very hard to go to a company that has billions of transactions and lots and lots of revenue and you know, their core business and say, hey, we want to add something to this little, little tiny part of it. We want to add something to the checkout receipt. And to get them to care about that was very, very hard. We cared about that a lot. Um, so, you know, and I call this the TiVo problem because we effectively built TiVo, but we didn't have Comcast. Right. And uh, my concern was that, I mean, and actually if we had to do it over again, the way to have potentially built trial pay would have been to say, let's build Stripe first, and yeah. then after that gets critical mass, after we have distribution for this thing that is in many respects a commodity, I mean, I don't mean that disrespectfully to, to Stripe, I don't mean that disrespectfully to any company that does a very, very key part of critical infrastructure, but they're doing something that doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles attached to it. You get massive distribution for that, you, you get very, very patient, um, you make sure it works very, very well, and then you add the bells and whistles on top. Right. And even though people like to, to hate on Comcast, I mean, what they did for V1 of their product, if you will, is they strung a lot of cables and they made this thing work, and then eventually they were in the position with tens of millions of customers to introduce their own TiVo called the Digital Video Recorder, and now TiVo kind of became a patent troll. So that, that was kind of my key learning. I'm kind of curious, what, what was your key yeah. learning? I mean, I, I, so just to kind of build, build on that, I mean, if you think about now what trial pay looks like inside of Visa, um, and you know, I sort of have this view that most acquisitions the ones that work <laughs> either work because you kind of leave them alone entirely or you sort of fully absorb them. And this was a case where we, we took that innovation, put it onto a much, much larger platform at scale. And so, you know, today, if you look at what we, you know, we've done with local offers in Uber, you actually start to see how that innovation works at scale. I mean, you, you go back to your example of, um, you know, I'm gonna get lunch today at Chipotle or at Chili's, how does that actually benefit me vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a game? In, in this example, when I go have lunch at, at uh, Chipotle, I can actually get credit in my Uber ride. Right. Um, I think that would have been very difficult for us to have pulled off um, in a, as a standalone company. And so um, that principle, you know, uh, I think what it did, it, it limited the number of companies that I think we could ultimately work with. But when we combined them, we actually landed up getting that innovation sitting on top of a you know, you know much more sort of scalable platform. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the other kind of you know learning um, 
uh, for me from you know from from TrialPay is that just the the payments ecosystem is unbelievably complex and um, sometimes defensibility is just simplifying it. So I think we had the conversation about Stripe early on and you know we were a pretty large payment um, you know, sort of processor um, just because it was a complicated thing to do. And I think we always dismissed that um, and said that that isn't very defensible. Um, so I think that that um, uh, is, is something that we, at the time, if we spent more time in that, I think we could have built an interesting payments company, not just this intersection of payments and advertising, just because it is super complicated. Yeah, and I, I think it's hard to start off with TiVo, recognize that this whole distribution thing is important, then go build Comcast while still maintaining TiVo when the, more, when the <laughs> world perhaps isn't ready for TiVo. Um, because we tried building Stripe, if you remember. Like we actually built a payment processor, and I remember it was very controversial within the company because like why are we, there already exist 100 payment processors, like why are we doing this? And it was actually hard to sell the team, sell, sell the troops internally, because I think it, it strategically made sense, but we didn't do, I mean we, we, we built one, but it wasn't the best in class as opposed to like our TiVo product, if you, if you will, I think was. Yeah, yeah I mean I, I think the point is that we, that had we focused on it, I think we could have done that. Yep. And, that and that certainly is a, you know, is a learning for me. Um, so we're, um, so maybe kind of talking about payments now, and <coughs> less about uh, history and, uh, and, and lore from, from the early days of trial pay. Like where, where do you see payments going or what are the things that you find most exciting about it? Yeah, so, you know, obviously from the, the visa vantage point, I think we get a pretty good view of what's happening kind of, you know, globally around the world. Um, and there are a couple things that I think are super interesting. One is the idea of verticalized commerce. And this is really an innovation that is coming out of you know, Alibaba and Tencent where you have a whole commerce ecosystem and payments is just embedded as part of that um, ecosystem. Um, I mean, I think examples here would be maybe Uber or Toast um, where you have, you've built all of this functionality that um, in the past would have been separate systems and the payment is embedded and frankly, is not something that uh, merchants have to think about. Um, I think that's both an opportunity um, for, uh, for startups or for you know, sort of payments in the, in, in the ecosystem, but it's also a threat because if you're, if you're building that ecosystem, you have tremendous power over who is the processor. So you take Toast, for example, you know, they've done all the hard work of verticalizing restaurant point of sale everything from the front of the house to the way that the whole ecosystem works, their decision as to who's going to actually process the payments is really about who has the pipes to kind of plug into that ecosystem. Right. Um, in the case of, you know, Tencent or, um, you, know, or you know, sort of Alipay, you've really got entire ecosystems that are managing everything from the menu that I see when I walk into a store uh, to, um, you know, where do I go after that, after that visit, and payments is just embedded. So I think we're going to see a big race toward verticalized commerce. I think when you put together in the U.S. at least what Amazon's trying to do, or Google's trying to do with Echo and a few other things, you'll see payments just recede into the background. Um, and that may become harder for others to penetrate. Um, if my entire... Um, you know, Amazon today is almost like a sort of uh, enterprise software for my life. At some point, they're going to have, you know, my entire supply chain will just be sitting in the cloud and stuff will show up at my house based upon my usage. And that's how companies work. Um, it's very hard to think of. The, there's almost no payment in that, in that, in that right. world. It's just consumption that happens to be uh, fronted by some sort of, you know, store of value. That, that's one area. Um, yeah, so I, I'm curious what, what, what you think about on the you know, verticalized commerce trend. Yeah, I think, I think that's certainly true. I mean, the, the thing that I, um, one thing on payments is that if you, if you look at the plastic world uh, and payments are increasingly going towards plastic or towards digital and away from cash, 
So if you look at that world where a lot of the advertising is really around how do I influence share of spend? So you do it at the network layer, like Visa wants people to use Visa cards, but ultimately Visa doesn't make Visa cards. Visa has card issuers who issue cards that go on the Visa network. So this begets Samuel L. Jackson saying, what's in your wallet for Capital One? Why does he do that? Not so much to get new cardholders. I mean, that's part of it. But also, if you have five cards in your wallet, and one of them is a Capital One card, and one of them is an, a Chase Amazon card, and one of them is an American Express card, when you go to Chipotle, which one are you going to pull out? And why do you choose it? And there might be some background processing in your brain, because you watched uh, some commercial five hours ago with, with Sammy saying, go use, you know, what's in your wallet? Use Capital One. That gets you to use Capital One versus uh, the online wallet, or rather like the Apple Pays, the Google Pays of the world, where I mean, they're still in their infancy, but if that takes off and all these different payment modes are actually digitized, you're not really choosing, like I wanna pay with this, like I, as far as I know, my Apple Pay thing seems to be like alphabetized. So my Amazon card pops up first and I end up paying with my Amazon card, which is a Visa card, so don't worry about it. Um, so that, that's, I think there's a lot of interesting things that start changing when, what is your default card for a lot of these applications? I think that, that's one thing in payments that I find interesting, like um, if the entire stack moves to your phone, and I, I have a presentation that I think I've, I've shared with you on this, but like you can actually start unbundling the different components of, of a credit card. So part of a credit card is the payment, part of the credit card is the credit part if you don't pay your bill on time. But in Apple Pay, as an example, what if you add a credit provider? Right. Um, you add Lending Club there, you have the payment go through here, and it's, it's potentially bad for the big banks. Um, and the opportunity might be for startups that, uh, maybe it's a robo-advisor for debt that says, hey, you know, pay off, all. there's a company called Tally that does this as an example. So, you know, I think that's interesting. I think there's also a lot of opportunity in commercial cards yeah. um, and providing more granularity uh, that way. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think the, the, the wallet is a, is a good example of both sort of payments disappearing, but also sort of unbundling. So a lot of what I think issuers today are providing is uh, authenticating a customer. Uh, and by the way, like in, in the US at least, debit cards are um, a very large percentage of transactions. And so that credit point um, is becoming you know, less and less of a, of a, of a, of a use case. And so uh, why can't you have credit at the point of sale, say a firm, or have some, inter some, some intermediary sit between me and my actual debit card? I think those types of applications become a lot more interesting because you've done two things. You've authenticated the customer um, there's a there's a method of payment, and now you're just adding the sort of you know credit layer on top of that. That's super interesting. Um, so, um, and, and I'm not sure if that benefits the incumbents or, or sort of you know, benefits startups. But um, uh, you know, as you a, as you sort of digitize payments, you have the opportunity to unbundle some of the functionality that's there today, and I think that's probably going to happen uh, across all types of, you know, all types of payment. Um, the other point about having multiple cards is we haven't really come up with a system where you optimize. And so maybe you should use your Amazon Prime card only on Amazon and Whole Foods where you get 5% back, right. but you want to use your Capital One card for international trips. Um, and today that's kind of murky and unclear and a lot of the consumer messaging is actually unclear. Uh, I think one of my sort of takeaways from thing at Visa is for all the marketing that's spent, it's, it's incredible how confusing uh, or confused customers are as to what the benefits are on their card. Right. Uh, you know, some of the things we're, we're thinking about are um, how do some of the trends in crypto and sort of, you know, digital currencies impact payments? And one of the things that we look at is what does a, uh, what does a digital fiat look like? And so today we have really, you know, uh, payments are electronic in the sense that uh, we're not carrying cash around, so the ledger is updated in real time, but settlement is delayed. Um, once you combine that into a native digital asset, you have what I think was never sort of happened before, which is the notion of programmable money. Because at that point, 
I've got the proof of funds in my, in my wallet and I can have a smart contract that can do some things that, you know, that I can't do with a sort of ledger settlement um, uh, sort of setup that, 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 that sort of exists today. And so, you know, uh, when that starts to happen or if that starts to happen, that radically changes how, how payments work. Um, I think, you know, the, the set of circumstances where digital fiat exists are, you know, more around kind of how, how, how governments might want to sort of implement this. But you could see, certainly, if I was a autocratic state and I wanted to have perfect visibility into all transactions in my economy, um, I could implement a central bank digital currency, uh, demonetize the larger bills, um, remove the lower bound on interest rates, uh, have tax collection at the point of sale. So don't have to rely on some merchant um, who then has to report her sales. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why I think a nation state could implement a central bank digital currency. Uh, on the other side, you might have a you know kind of upstart nation uh, who wants to um, sort of innovate and maybe they'll adopt a central bank digital currency. So um, I'm not sure the U.S. is going to do this first, but if any of those scenarios happen, I think it you know, completely changes the way payments work because you have the store of value in a wallet. I'm not sure that you need an intermediary to then, uh, to then actually you know, sort of you know, transfer the value. Um, and so uh, I think that's a trend that, that may appear um, as, as governments grapple with um, you know, how, how they can take advantage of, of cryptocurrencies. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's interesting. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd call it cryptocurrencies per se. I think it's more of this idea of, uh, you know, the government controls the money supply, but doesn't really control the commerce supply, which is almost as important. So if you think about, I remember actually when I was, when, when we became part of Visa, um, I think at one point we had to enforce sanctions against Crimea. And this wasn't Visa doing it, it was like the government of the United States says, okay, Putin annexed Crimea, we think that's bad, and therefore you cannot do business in Crimea, United States companies, Visa being one of them. And it turns out that a Crimean that's buying something with their Visa card or their MasterCard in Crimea, uh, that transaction gets routed through San Francisco if it's Visa, or Purchase New York if it's MasterCard. So the government of the United States made a private company uh, not allow commerce to happen in another nation state that's 5,000 plus miles away. So, and th this was never an issue because governments printed cash and or once upon a time cash was backed by gold and like the government really just wasn't involved in this process. Like one government couldn't do anything to constrict commerce in another government's territory, but now that, that does happen, which is actually kind of interesting. So it makes sense uh, at, at some level, like this is why China has China Union Pay because, or CUP, um, they nationalize their commerce system, if you will, um, so that it's not subject to any third parties. So you, you can make an argument, because I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, which is you can make a very strong argument that the entire flow of money should be controlled by the government. Um, now, from the startup or corporation perspective, it's like you would rather that not be the case. But there is a lot that could be done if there was one single kind of programmable and um, not watchable, that's kind of a scary word, but uh, a set of, like a, a currency that actually is a little bit more controlled um, as opposed to something where it's like there are all these disparate actors, everything's fungible, you can't really track everything. Right. Um, and moving to a currency actually, uh, moving to a digital currency, I mean, call it cryptocurrency or not, but like there would be a lot of repercussions for it. But in many, in many respects, this is kind of like the, the incumbents of the 200 plus nations on earth, they've been doing this kind of print money um, thing for a long time. So I, I, don't, I don't know who's gonna be the first to adopt that. I mean, I think once a nation state discovers the, the superpowers of controlling a digital currency, that's gonna be intoxicating. Um, yep. and, uh, and I think that, that will will certainly have an impact. I mean, it, it may not happen, it may not happen in, in Western democracies. Um, actually, one of the challenges with Visa and MasterCard is if you try to buy Bitcoin today, that is seen as buying cash because it's totally fungible. 
And so as a result, there's a whole lot of, there's a certain uh, rate that gets charged, there's certain kind of currency controls, a few, a few other things that sort of come into play. But if I could buy um, Ether and know that it's going to be used to buy Filecoin, right. and it's specifically um, used for that purpose, well then we can create an MCC code for storage, and it's a perfectly allowed transaction, right. provided that the resulting digital currency is used for that purpose. Right. Like that doesn't exist today, and that can be enforced by government or sort of commercial entities. But I think that that's some of the exciting stuff that's, that's sort of coming down the line. Yep, yep, totally agreed. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Fun to relive uh, some old stories and think about new futures. Yeah, great to be here.